Now, I realize, I realize I'm going to date myself with what I'm about to share with you. When I was growing up, there was a commercial on TV that went something like this. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Anybody remember that commercial back in the day? Um, Some people are saying, yeah, you're awful young to be knowing that commercial. Um, I'm happy to hear that I'm not that old, actually. So it reminds me of a story, and it's a true story. It's about a young boy who wanted to surprise his dad for Father's Day. Father's Day rolled around, and he just wanted to do something very special for his daddy. So he decided to serve his dad breakfast in bed. How many of you like breakfast in bed? I got anybody here who enjoys that? Absolutely. So he was thinking, now what am I going to serve dad? And he was started putting his menu together and he decided Fruit Loops. Oh, Fruit Loops are good. And, and, and he said, you know what, dad? Dad loves a good bagel and, and I know dad enjoys his cup of coffee. So he starts in and he po- takes the fruit loops out of the cupboard and he pours them into a bowl and then he takes sugar and he covers the fruit loops in sugar because you all know fruit loops is you know need some sugar and and then he pours some milk over the fruit loops and then he takes out a bagel cracks it in half and he puts it in the toaster and then when he's done it resembles more of a hockey puck than it does a bagel and he puts a little scrape some butter on that and then he pours out some coffee for his dad, and then he puts a little surprise in the coffee. So he puts it all on a tray, and he goes bursting into his dad's room, and he says, hey, daddy, happy Father's Day. I made you breakfast in bed. Now his dad's a good sport, and he sits up, and he says, oh, thank you so much, son. I know I'm really going to enjoy this. Now understand? The Fruit Loops have been sitting in the bowl for the last 20 minutes, soaking up all that milk. And so his dad's looking at this soggy mess of Fruit Loops, and he, again, he's a good sport about this. He puts in the spoon, and he puts it into his mouth, and there's so much sugar in that cereal right now that his pancreas is in rebellion. He's about to go into a sugar coma. He's a good sport. And then he looks at the bagels and he's trying to figure out the, you know, what part of that bagel can I bite into and not get charcoal. And so again, he picks one up and he finds a spot he thinks he can eat and he just takes a bite. He's like, yep, son, right on. And the little boy's getting excited. And he says, daddy, drink the coffee. And his dad's look, he's looking at the coffee and going, I don't know if I'm going to survive this breakfast. But again, he loves his son, willing to die for his son apparently, but he tries the coffee and actually it's passable, it's drinkable, and he starts drinking a little bit more and and his son says, Daddy, no, 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 Daddy, you have to drink the whole thing because there's a surprise in the coffee. And the dad's going, what do you mean there's a surprise in the coffee? So he takes a spoon and he digs into the coffee and he brings up this green toy soldier. And his dad's going, why is there a soldier in my coffee? To which his son replied, the best part of waking up is soldiers in your cup. I love an empty cup. I I know this is a glass, but imagine with me, I know you can do this, that this is a cup. And I love an empty cup because you can put in it whatever it is you like. And and so if you're my dad, this would be water. 90% of the time, my dad, you could find him sitting in his favorite chair and beside him is a cup or a glass of water. Now, for me, growing up, it was milk. I could drink a liter of milk a day. I mean, my, my family needed to own a dairy farm in order to keep me in milk. Today, I have two boys, Jakob and Justin, and it's orange juice, and I need to have stock in Tropicana in order to keep them in orange juice. My wife, it can be a good smoothie. Uh, for me, I enjoy smoothies as well. But then there's Amalia, and Amalia loves a good cup of tea so that she makes her tea leaves it on the counter, walks away, and forgets her tea until it's cold. But she loves a cup of tea. 
As a matter of fact, did you know the British, on average, and Tom, maybe you can verify this, have at least four cups of tea per day? And then you have people like my mom and my brother. My brother loves soda. He loves Pepsi. And he can drink a liter to two liters of Pepsi a day. Um, Now, that might surprise you, but they tell us that in North America, the average North American, get this, drinks at least, on average, at least 600 cans of soda per year. That's at least a liter, and that's, that's, that's the average. But don't miss my point. The best part about having an empty cup is that you can put in it whatever it is you want. Now, here's where I'm going with this. This cup... It's a little bit like your life. You see, every day you wake up and your day is before you and you can pour into your life whatever it is you choose. And for some of you, what you're going to pour into your life most days is, well, you're going to fill your day with work. Think about this. You get up, you get ready for work. You hop in your car, you drive to work. Some of you, you drive a half hour to an hour, but you're headed to work. You get to work and you work, 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 and then you get home, you recover from work, and then after you've had your supper, you're preparing for work the next day, and then you go to bed at night and you're dreaming about work. But don't get me wrong, for some of us, or a lot of us, you fill your day with work. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. After all, the Bible says if you wanna eat, you gotta work. Okay, you know this. For some of you, well, you're going to fill your day with family. And you get up and you're, well, you're chasing your family. You're chasing them out of bed. And you're chasing them to the kitchen table so they have breakfast. And then you chase them out the door to get to school or to get to work. And then you take them to practice. And it's band and it's choir and it's soccer. It's all these activities. And then you chase them to the dinner table. And then it's to clean up after your family. And when you go to bed... You're wondering why you had a family. (laughs) But for some of you, your day is filled with your family. And now for some of you, your day is filled with your social network. And the first thing you do when you wake up is you look at your phone. And you're lying there in bed and you might take a selfie of you in bed. And then you get up and you're at the kitchen table and you might be taking a picture of your meal or a picture of your lunch or your dinner and you're walking down the street and you're texting to people and the next thing you know you run into a telephone pole because you're not paying attention. And then you get to the evening and before you go to bed at night the last thing you see is your phone and you kiss it goodnight. Don't miss my point. Your life is a lot like this empty glass and you get to fill it with whatever it is you want. Now, here's the problem. After you filled your day with your work, your family, your friends, and your life, can I ask, how much room do you have for Jesus? You follow what I'm asking because I've discovered that we tend to receive Jesus in one of two ways. And for some of you, you wake up in the morning and you say a little prayer and you get you a little bit of Jesus because we like to get Jesus in doses. And, And you might have, well, you might have listened to the Sabbath school nuggets or you looked at your Sabbath school lesson and you got a little bit more Jesus. And then you might have had a devotional and you got a little bit of Jesus. And then you were listening to maybe a podcast or Christian radio on your way to work and you got yourself a little bit more Jesus. And then somebody caught you off in traffic and you said something and you just lost your Jesus. (laughs) But you just came to church. You're gonna redeem yourself. So you come to church easy, early, early, So you just want a little bit of Jesus. And then you got into the Sabbath school lesson and you got a little bit of Jesus. And then you got your praise on and you love the singing and the prayer and the giving and you got some more Jesus. And we're gonna do communion today and you wash somebody's feet and you are praying together and you got some more Jesus. And then you looked across the church and you saw somebody you don't like and you just lost your Jesus. You're laughing because you know it's true. (laughs) I know it's true. 
Here's the thing. The second problem is I love my life. I, 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 love, I love my family. I love ministering to you and being your pastor. And I too, I love my social networking. And so here I am and I get up and I'm gonna fill my life with ministry and work. And then I'm loving on my family and I'm loving on life and the gym. And here's the thing. By the time I'm done at the end of the day, I've got a full day. And have you ever heard the saying, it's pretty hard to fill a full cup? And, and so here I am at the end of the day, and I'm trying to catch a little Jesus. So I might have a family devotional, and, and I get a little bit of Jesus, and I might say a prayer before I go to bed because I'm tired and I'm just like, please, Lord, give me a good night's sleep. And I might get a little bit of Jesus. And what I'm hoping is that I'm going to get enough Jesus to just color my life. And here's the problem. 2,000 years ago, Jesus didn't die to just add a little color to your life. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said to a 12 men in an upper room, I'm going to pour out my entire life. And he didn't pour out that life just so you could have Jesus in small doses. Now, Jesus said, I want you to empty yourself so that you can be filled with me. And we talk about this and we preach this, and then we go, oh, hang on. <laughs> How much of this do I need to empty out? I love my job and I, I, I love my life, so how much of this do I really have to give up? I mean, I got a little room for Jesus. I mean, is it not okay if I just have a little room for Jesus because I really like my life? And Jesus says, listen, and you might have heard this before, but Jesus says, no, you need to be emptied of yourself so that you can be filled with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he will not be Lord at all. I think you've heard that somewhere before, amen? And so Jesus comes along and he says, listen, I'm going to the cross and I'm going to be poured out. And the reason Jesus is poured out is so that not only could he shed his blood to redeem you, but that his blood would go into us, cleanse us, and transform us. Because he's not looking to color your life or influence your life or occasionally impact your life. What Jesus wants to do is flood your life with his spirit so that what he pours into you, you can pour into others. The Bible talks about this. It's Romans. It's chapter five and verse five. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Not to just add a little bit, but to fill our hearts with love because to be filled with the Holy Spirit, when the Bible uses that term, I want you to think of baptism. What does baptism mean? What does it mean to be baptized? It means to be fully immersed in it. And so Jesus says, I want to be poured out so much so that you're going to be so filled with me that you're going to be baptized and immersed in my spirit so that you will experience a river of life that's going to overflow so much so that you're going to become a river of life to the lives of those around you. You see, Jesus isn't looking to be in your life in doses. He's looking to fill your life with his presence. I'm reminded of a poem. And the poem goes a little something like this. The master was searching for a vessel to use. On the shelf there were many. Which one would he choose? Take me, cried the gold one. I'm shiny and bright. I'm of great value, and I do things just right. My beauty and luster will outshine all the rest. For someone like you, master, gold would be best. The master passed on with no word at all. He looked at a silver urn, narrow and tall. I'll serve you, dear master. I'll pour out your wine, and I'll be at your table wherever you dine. My lines are so graceful, my carving so true, and my silver 
will always compliment you. Unheeding the master passed on to the brass, it was wide mouthed and shallow and polished like glass. Here, here, cried the vessel, I know I will do. Place me on your table for all men to view. Look at me, called the goblet of crystal so clear, my transparency shows my contents so dear. Though fragile am I, I will serve you with pride, and I'm sure I'll be happy in your house to abide. Then the master looked down and saw a vessel of clay, empty and cracked, it helplessly lay. No hope had the vessel that the master might choose to cleanse and to make whole, to fill and to use. Ah, this is the vessel I've been hoping to find. I will mend it and use it and make it all mine. I need not the vessel with pride of itself, nor the one who is narrow to sit on the shelf, nor the one who is big-mouthed and shallow and loud, nor the one who displays his contents so proud. Not the one who thinks he can do all things just right, but this plain earthly vessel filled with my spirit and might." Then gently he lifted the vessel of clay, mended and cleansed it and filled it that day, spoke to it kindly. There's work you must do. Just pour out to others as I pour into you. This is why I love communion. You see, because it reminds me, every time I come to the communion bread and I I see the communion wine, I am reminded that Jesus was poured out so that he could fill us, fill me and fill you so that what he pours into us, we can pour into others. And so at this time, I just want to have a word of prayer over the emblems of the communion bread and the communion wine. Can we pray, please? Jesus, we are so thankful, Lord, that 2,000 years ago, you poured yourself out for us, that you wanted not only to redeem us from sin and cleanse us from sin and heal our broken lives, but Jesus, you wanted to fill us with the power and might of your spirit. And today, Lord, we pray that you would bless the communion bread as we remember that not only were you poured out, but that you were broken so that we could be healed. And Lord, we pray that you would bless the communion wine as we remember that you were poured out for our salvation, our redemption, and our adoption into the family of God. And and as we continue to remember, Lord, what it is you have done for us, I pray that we would give our lives to you that we would empty ourselves. And Lord, may we be baptized, immersed, and filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So on that evening, after they had washed each other's feet, after Jesus had preached a sermon on love, he took a loaf of bread And and he took it in his hands and he started to take it apart. And he said, I want you to remember that that my body, it's going to be broken for you. And, And I want you to understand why I'm breaking my body for you because God is love. Did you know that the theology of the Seventh day Adventist church begins with God is love? And that means that God, in his love, lives first lives first to bless and benefit you before he blesses and benefits himself. And Jesus said, whenever you eat this bread, whenever you see my, remember my brokenness for you, it's because I'm determined to save you, to bless and benefit you. Is there anybody here who's been blessed by Jesus? Is there anybody here who has benefited from the cross of Jesus Christ? Jesus said, Remember, I was broken for you so that I could mend and redeem your broken heart. And he said, please take it and eat of it. And then he took the cup. 
only this time it wasn't an empty cup. It was filled with something that would come to represent the greatest sacrifice in the history of sacrifices, that Jesus himself would be poured out, that he would pour out all of his love and all of his life to show us that God the Father loves you. And Jesus said, I'm going to be poured out for you, but please remember this command to love one another as I have loved you. And let me help you understand that as I am poured out into you, I want you to pour into others what I've poured that love into you. And he said, whenever you eat the bread and you drink this wine, please do this in remembrance of me. You see, an empty cup is one of the best things you could have because you get to put into that cup, you get to pour into your day anything you choose. So as you leave this house of worship, as you go into the world, as you go about your week, I want to ask, what are you going to fill your life with? And can I suggest, fill your life with Jesus so that you can pour into others what Jesus has poured into you. Because this is what communion is all about. It's not only about receiving the love of God, but it's about pouring out the love of God into each other. And that's why we call it communion.